You are listening to Library Out Loud, recorded at Albert Wisner Public Library in Warwick, New York, on February 26, 2016, by Susan Supak. We're talking today with Anthony Spicer, who is the director of the Newington Cropsey Foundation Gallery of Art, dedicated to the life and art of the famous Hudson River School artist, Jasper Francis Cropsey. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Susan. We are thrilled to have you here, especially in light of Jasper Cropsey's special connection to our area, and we look forward to talking and learning more about that. First, let's talk about the Foundation and Everest. There is a wonderful quote from the New York Times that reads, Paintings by the Hudson River School artist Jasper Cropsey reside in the White House, the National Gallery of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and museums of Yale and Princeton. But the best place to commune with Cropsey's glorious 19th century landscapes is in an oasis in Hastings-on-Hudson. And that would be where you come in. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Certainly. Um, when Cropsey left Warwick in 1884, uh, they, he and his wife Mariah, they settled in Hastings at a house he called Everest. That home remained in his family through his descendants until a foundation was created in 1977. And the foundation really consists of that home, new gallery building that we built, and uh, our extensive collection of Cropsey papers and paintings and things. Well, I have been there, and I have been down to the Metro North Station and looked across that parking lot, rush hour, commuters, and seen this gem. I felt like I was looking at the secret garden. It's amazingly beautiful. Thank you. And up the hill is his home, that beautiful uh, yellow house. It's just great. Can you give us a brief introduction of who Jasper Cropsey is and why we should know who he is? Well, he was uh, one of the most important American artists of the 19th century. Um, he basically a self-taught artist and known as a second-generation Hudson River School artist, but he came from a small farm in Staten Island and rose to great heights. At the height of his career, he was um, uh, presented to Queen Victoria, presented to Abraham Lincoln, so he really was a uh, world-famous and very successful American landscape artist. He was very, very famous in his time and has become famous again. Now his art has... Uh, has a real appreciation. It does. And can you describe what the Hudson River School is? It was started by Thomas Cole. It wasn't really a school. It was more of a school of thought of how painting should be done. And Cole and Asher B. Durand, their thought was to depict nature as accurately as possible and to reflect spiritual, spirituality and God in nature. And those were kind of the main tenets of the Hudson River School, to go out into nature and sketch everything very faithfully and then later turn them into um, oil paintings and watercolors in their studios. Was that a response to the Industrial Revolution in some way, to the building of all these factories? For some of the artists it was. Mm -hmm. uh, for Cole in particular, because he had come from a very um, kind of depressing mill town in Lancashire, England. So when he got to America, he considered America the new Garden of Eden. He had never seen anything like it. So his was a response, I think, to his childhood. Um, others like Cropsey and uh, perhaps Durant, they just had a love of nature, and in particular of American landscapes. Now, he didn't start out to be an artist, did he? He did not. He was uh, trained as an architect. He had a five-year architectural apprenticeship in Manhattan, and it was while in Manhattan um, he happened upon the National Academy of Design, and that's when he first saw the paintings of Thomas Cole, and he was immediately smitten and taught himself, started teaching himself how to paint when he was 19. And by the time he was 21, he was the youngest associate member ever elected to the National Academy. So, Which was the big art center of the day, was it not? It was. All artists wanted to follow their signature with NAD, meaning they were an academician. And he was only 19 years old? He was 21 when 21. he became a member, um, which is still to this day the youngest ever. So he really was a prodigy. Very young. I understand he has a big connection to our area. Can you tell us how that got started? 
Uh, well, he was connected to the general area because his wife, Mariah, her maiden name was Cooley, and uh, the Cooley homestead where she grew up was on Greenwood Lake in West Milford, New Jersey. So from a pretty young age, Cropsey was kind of around this area. But it was uh, after, really at the height of his fame, that he decided that his uh, first home that they would build, and he was in his late 40s, would be in Warwick. It was um, close enough to Greenwood Lake, yet far enough away from his in-laws, I think. So that was <laughs> one, of, one of the attractions. And he found a spot on the Warwick Mountain, and he wound up in 1867 um, starting to purchase property there, and he wound up with over 100 acres, and he started designing Aladdin, which is the name he called his home there, which was a 29-room mansion. Quite elaborate, I understand? Very elaborate. It was written up in Manhattan Magazine in 1883 and was known as the finest home in Orange County, New York, uh, but it was, it was a palatial estate with all... Um, antique furniture and custom-made furniture, and it overlooked uh, the Warwick Valley. And from the upper windows, he had views of uh, Mount Saddam and Eve and Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh -huh. and our love, our beloved, uh, iconic landmarks right. here and in Warwick. A lot of that right from Aladdin. It really was a prime spot. Did he paint from that home? Do you think he painted views from Aladdin? He absolutely did. He absolutely did paint from um sketches that he did from even from the roof to get some of the vantage points that he got um, and he would make the sketches there and then he had a large studio at Aladdin and he'd go down into a studio and make oil paintings from it. So. And I understand you paid a visit to that site before your interview here today. My wife Catherine and I were there about an hour ago and um, I sat in the car with our dog while well, <laughs> Catherine ran around with 50 mile an hour traffic taking pictures. So there are still Remains? Are they foundation? Is it a foundation? What's still there? It's it's private property. So mm -hmm. to go actually and see the remnants of the foundation, you need to get permission. Ah, okay. But what you can see right from Warwick Turnpike is the two stone pillars that uh, you would enter uh, onto the property from, which those are the things that remain. And then also the um, Warwick Historical Society has a very nice plaque on the road there, so you can kind of tell where it was. So the home itself no longer remains? The home burned down in 1909. After he moved away? Fortunately, uh, he never knew that it was destroyed because that was that home was one of his life's dreams. And I think that's one of the reasons why when he left Warwick in 1884, I've never found any evidence that he ever came back because I think it would have hurt him deeply to see Aladdin with other people residing there. So, so architecture stayed close to his heart. It did. And he, in his love of nature, which we can understand here, is just such a beautiful area. He studied nature, did he not? Botany, that kind of thing. How did he go about coming up with his paintings and his settings, his feelings of the art, that sort of thing? He sketched directly from nature to create all his paintings. Um, but when he was teaching himself to paint, um, he made a very grand statement for a 19-year-old. He said that, for me to become the kind of painter I need to be, um, I need to be a geologist and a botanist and a meteorologist. And he actually started buying old textbooks on these different subjects, which we, we have in his library at Everest. We've got geology books and botany books that were published before he was born in 1823. In 1823. So um, he was a real student of nature and a student of art, and he felt that to portray nature accurately, you really had to um, have a scientific knowledge of the things that you're looking at. So. He and his wife shared that love, didn't they? I, I saw some things that she had done which were absolutely exquisite. What Mariah did um, early on when they traveled through Europe was uh, to take flowers and plants and press them into pages and make very nice presentation books from them, um, all in her very beautiful handwriting, which detailing where she found the different species and uh, what the dates were. And so it's actually also a travel log. You can tell how they traveled through Scotland and Wales and Italy. And do you have that there at his home? We do. We have two of them on display, and then we have others that are in storage. In his studio. Is his studio similar to what he had here in Warwick? 
it's similar. You can tell that the same person designed, which would be him, designed both of them. The studio at Everest was the only part of the house that he designed. The rest of the home was 50 years old when they bought it, but he added the studio. That studio I would best describe as a miniaturized version of what he had here in Norway. Interesting. So why, why did he leave? What happened that he had this incredible home here in Warwick, and he loved it, and yet he left? What happened? His time in Warwick was, was a pivotal stage in his life, and actually in the uh, history of the Hudson River School. He started out in Warwick in 1867, purchasing land, and he was at the height of his career, and the Hudson River was really at its prime. Um, by 1880, the Hudson River School was all but gone and um, out of favor and not popular. And it was very difficult to sell any paintings. So um, the time in Warwick showed him going from the height to really the depths of his career. And the move out of Warwick to Hastings was a financial move. Though he wasn't a pauper. I mean, his home, Everest, is quite it's, lovely and sophisticated and it's stylish. It's beautiful. But Aladdin and the furnishing of Aladdin and his lifestyle had left him in a lot of debt. And so uh, they did get a foreclosure notice on Aladdin and uh, it was actually printed in the Warwick oh, Advertiser. No. A chattel mortgage sale where everything was to be sold. But then the little tiny notice in the Advertiser in 1884 was that the Cropsey home has sold and the mortgage sale is canceled. So that was good. Thank and goodness. He was able to sell everything without being foreclosed upon. What replaced the Hudson River paintings? A lot of different styles were coming in, uh, pre-impressionism, Barbizon school, um, a lot more European styles. 1876, the Centennial Exhibition in um, Philadelphia was the first annual exhibit there where um, European paintings uh, outnumbered American paintings by a lot. So the styles had changed. Even the American artists that were popular were trained in Europe, in France or Germany or Italy. So uh, there were a lot of different styles coming in, and to me, part of the thing with the Hudson River School was they were the dominant art movement in America for 30 or 40 years, which is unprecedented, and I think it was just kind of time. It would have been nice if it didn't fall so precipitously, if it just kind of faded down a little bit, but it really was um, a steep drop where uh, 1865, a painting that Cropsey could have sold for $1,000 in 1875, he would be lucky to get a hundred dollars for it, if he could sell it. So he was getting ten cents on the dollar. It was really a monumental drop, and he was he was the only one really of the Hudson River School painters that kept painting in this style. He didn't change his style, and he didn't stop painting. So, so it was quite a change for him. It was. When he uh, when he left Warwick, how, do you have roughly an idea of how many paintings we have here of this area? You know, most of the paintings were always sold in New York City. Uh, some stayed in Warwick. Uh, I think uh, the Burt family, who I think is still has a presence here, and the Sanford families, they were patrons of him and friends of, of Cropsey's and a few others that lived in this area. But for the most part, his paintings sold, you know, in the bigger galleries and auction houses in New York City. Do you have many of those paintings now in the foundation or at his home? Uh, our collection... Uh, including the gallery and the home, consists of about 120 oil paintings and roughly 30 watercolor paintings. That is out of a total of 2,400 oil paintings that he did in his career and about 150 watercolor. So he was very, very prolific. Uh, so there are uh, close to 2,500 oil paintings out there that he did. Do you have some personal favorites? Those from Warwick, of course. I don't have any that I don't like, <laughs> but I actually one of my favorites is the view um, of the Warwick Valley from Aladdin, because that was so dear to him. So that is one of my favorites. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. We love to hear that. So, do you continue researching his collection? We do. We are in the process of publishing the catalog raisonné of his work in oil, and we have uh, volume one finished, uh, published, and volume two almost finished, and it'll be a three-volume set because it was pro so prolific. But we do, we, we keep abreast of uh, contemporary sales and auctions and exhibits, as well as we still do uh, historical research into his work. Now the foundation, I, as I understand it, was founded by his granddaughter, Isabel? 
by his great granddaughter. His great granddaughter. Isabel's daughter, Barbara, is our is our chairman, Barbara Newington. Uh, Mrs. Newington was born at Everest and grew up there. And uh, her father, her parents were the last family members that lived there. And after her father died in the early 1970s, Mrs. Newington and her husband, John, um, founded the foundation in 1977 to open the home to the public and make her, their collection uh, available for everyone to see. And do you show other art there? We don't. We, we have a smattering of Hudson River School artists in our collection, but they're really not, not out on display. Uh, it's really a cropsy experience when you come to the house and the gallery. Well, that certainly is a wonderful experience to have and definitely something that people should see, should learn about, and should learn more about in our area. What should a person do if they'd like to learn more about him, about the School of Art, about the Foundation and his home? Well, uh, come to visit the Foundation. First of all, we are, we are open by appointment, uh, tours of the gallery and tours of the house. And so it's really nice to have firsthand experience of both. At the house, it's more personal because that's where he and his family lived. And then at the gallery, it's more about our collection and the paintings. But um, all of the major museums that go to the American Wing at the Metropolitan, and they have a wonderful Hudson River School collection. So they're out there. They're, there's a lot of things available for people to see. Well, it is so important for us to know about our history as a community, not only to appreciate where we live, but to appreciate an incredible artist and his important work. So we thank you, Anthony, very much for sharing this with us. We have been talking with Anthony Spicer, the director of the Newington Cropsey Foundation Gallery of Art from the Albert Wisner Public Library in Warwick, New York, 2016's Best Small Library in America.